Hi Good guys, evening. how are you doing? So as for anybody who's just joined us, uh, welcome to this tasting um, with uh, for Highland Park with Mulligan's um, whiskey shop, Mulligan Ghost Whiskey Store. Uh, my name is Alan Glynn. I am the Irish ambassador for Highland Park. Uh, unfortunately, we had hoped to have Martin Marksbarden here today, but uh, he wasn't able to make it. So hopefully I can uh, fill, his, fill his quite large shoes and really do him proud and give you all that real Highland experience. Um, I've been doing this with, I've been Highland Park for about two years now and really kind of lived and worked with the brand. So it's, it's such an exciting and interesting brand to talk about and really excited, excited to do it. Uh, thanks very much again to Michael and the guys in Mulligans for giving us this opportunity to be here and to do this for you. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, I'm a big uh, Highland Park fan. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of people on here, I'm pretty sure to do sweepstakes on our previous events and we choose a minute or in, in any other event we're doing other whiskies and I'm sure to choose a minute. When will Michael mention Highland Park? You know, there's definitely some sort of sideline betting going on there. And uh, so tonight, it's, you had to have minute number one really, didn't you? So if, you were, if you were doing a side bet there, Patty. Um, but no, delighted tonight, we've got eight fantastic whiskies for you. Uh, after whiskey number four, we'll take a, approximately a five minute break. Um, the tasting order for you tonight, the first four are, it's uh, Highland Park 10 year old, followed by Highland Park Ambassador's Choice, followed by Dark Origins, and then Highland Park 12 year old. And we'll take a break and then we'll give you the, the, the order I'll give you the order of the, 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 the next four after that as well. So in the second half, it'll be the 15-year-old, Twisted Tattoo, Triskelion, and then 18-year-old. So we might as well get started. We're here to drink whiskey and taste some yeah. whiskey tonight. So let's get a 10-year-old in the glass. You'll have a, a nice, lovely uh, miniature bottle like this. Um, I'm lucky I've got the two remaining sets, all the more for me. Uh, but I also have the, the lovely bottle of it here and what's left in that as well. Um, Alan, Highland Park 10-year-old, it's that's an, it was a new addition to uh, two, three years ago? Yeah, launched in 2017. Uh, so it's it's affectionately known as the Viking Scars. And that's really to kind of an homage to the Viking heritage of Orkney and how one third of the inhabitants can actually trace their lineage back to the Vikings. Uh, so what we do is we take our, <clears throat> as we go through this evening, we're going to talk about our processes of making our whiskey and how we uh, um, malt our barley and everything. So we'll get to learn it as we go. But really kind of one of the defining features for a lot of our whiskies, when you'll find with our mash tun and our mash bill, is that it's all very similar. It doesn't really change across our whiskies. It's our aging process that really makes a massive difference and our cast caramelization, um, which, we'll all, which we'll get into as we go. Um, but this particular whiskey aged predominantly in European sherry oak and also American uh, sherry oak casks, uh, all new fills. So we, a, lot, a big thing you're going to see as we talk about is our impact on wood and how the wood really kind of affects our whiskies. And we are quite lucky to be a part of a group in Edrington where we have a particular man employed. His name is Stuart McPherson and Stuart's job is literally to source wood to create our casks. So we see really the casks and our climate being a big, big part of this. But as we're just, as, what I'd like to do as we start to give you a feeling for Highland Park. And as we start in with the 10 year old, which will be kind of our entry level, our lighter style of whiskey that we have, I'm going to play a little video um, for you and have a listen and have a look at it to get the idea of our Viking heritage and our, and our Viking soul in Highland Park. single malt with Viking soul. But what does this mean? Not the traditional view of warriors with axes, but modern day Viking souls who like to do things differently, stretch their own skills and learn from others. At Highland Park we are proud to stand apart from the crowd, that's why our whiskey has been praised by experts and bartenders all around the world for decades. We stand apart because of our location, our people, and our whiskey. Our location. 
station is remote off the extreme north coast of Scotland. In fact, we are closer to Bergen in Norway than London. Made up of over 70 islands with a small population of 20,000 people. And since 1798, only a small band of men handcraft our iconic single malt in Kirkwall, where you'll find our distillery. Until 1468, Orkney was ruled by the Viking kingdoms of Denmark and Norway. And so even today, Arcadians still feel a strong connection with their Viking heritage. They're fiercely proud that Orkney has never been part of the establishment and that they've always been a band apart. Our dedicated distillery team have a deep-seated pride in Crafton Highland Park. That's why we have made with pride on Orkney on the side of our packaging. Paying tribute to the people that craft our whiskey by hand. Day in, day out, month after month, in some of the toughest weather imaginable. Like our personality, everything about our whiskey flows from our wild Arcadian environment. From cutting aromatic peat from Hobbiston Moor, hand turning barley on our ancient floor maltings, to maturing in sherry oak casks. It requires skill and discipline to create our intensely balanced whiskey, and we have over 200 years of experience. Viking souls are people who are brave, daring, and pioneering go further to seek out the brands that reflect their life. Authentic brands. Brands with great stories and personality. Passionate people who don't settle for average. People who know that life is about adventures with friends and creating great memories. Highland Park is crafted by the descendants of the Vikings and is waiting to be discovered by modern day Viking souls. Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking soul. So then, that was really just to kind of give you an idea of the location and Orkney and really what we're looking at with our whiskey tonight. So going back on our 10 year old, it was to give you a feeling and emotion that is within Highland Park. So we have our 10 year old here. So what we find with our whiskey. Now, as we go along and we, as we taste and as we talk, everything is subjective. Everything, you know, we all have built up banks of tastes and banks of memories in our mind. So where I might get grassy notes, you might get that green apple. Where I might get a citrus note, you might get something very, very different. So it's all subjective. So as I talk, don't be afraid to get in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know if you have any thoughts yourselves. You might agree, disagree, whatever way you like. So with our 10 year old, we always get, with Highland Park, we're always gonna get that light kind of aromatic peat coming from our Hobbister Moor, uh, which gives us that real heather kind of honey style of peat. It's a treeless island as such, so all our peat comes from pure heather and pure uh, floral notes. So we always get that true in our nose. For me, being this, this is our 10 year old, like I said, it's one of our, it's our youngest style of whiskey. So we get those light notes. We get those green apples, as I call them, uh, vanillas, uh, citruses, and pepper spices on it, in our nose and in our taste. It's a beautiful whiskey, isn't it, Alan? I really, I really like this. It's, it, yeah. I'm a Sorry. big fan of some of the, the later, in, in the 12 year old, but. When the ten-year-old was released, I was like, "Okay, what's this all about? Why, 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 why is Island Park doing this?" You know, and then I, I understood some of the logics in it. It's it's an accessible for a bartender to play around with it. it it's a little bit lesser in the price point, so it it kicks a lot of boxes. You know, uh, for me, it's it's I've actually as much as I, I drink Island Park twelve-year-old, I probably these days probably drink more of the ten-year-old because I like that sort of trying to sort of feed off my brain and say, well, what's going on here? What's the difference? Like I've been drinking Highland Park 12 year old for over 20 years. Um, so getting to, you know, something different that's come down like this, you know, like, okay, well, what's this? Because it's, 
that and looking at what what does that two years difference of aging make? You know, the difference in maturation because it's all all the all the all the casks are, are, are seasoned in cherry, um, which is is excellent. And you know, something that Highland Park do as well is they, they have their own four maltings there. You know, they they malt their own barley. Uh, you know, the, all the, the the peated malt comes from there, which is highly irregular in Scotch whisky industry these days. You know, there's you can count on one one hand how many. It's only seven. I think it's only seven distilleries actually malt their own barley at the moment in Scotland. Okay, I've got seven fingers on that hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's a fantastic drama. I think it's it's a, it's now an, a more accessible entry into Highland Park. It's really, this is it. You know, this is, for me, this is like a, a bartender whiskey. As in, if someone comes into your bar, you want to try a different whiskey, don't want to spend too much on a whiskey. This is a good entry level into Highland Park. It's also something that, you know, you're a former bartender, I'm a former bartender, it's something you can play around with uh, and, and, and do some sort of cocktails and mixed drinks with it as well. You know, whiskey doesn't always have to be drink neat and straight. You can you know, drink it as you, you, you want it, you know. Now, you know, if you put a bottle of Coke into this, then I'm going to remove you from the, the Zoom meeting tonight. Like, but, you know, you can play around with these. these <laughs> oh, most definitely. And we'll have some lovely... Uh, I've just realised I said Coca-Cola. Thank God I never said Pepsi. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> for, for those that you don't know, Highland Park is uh, distributed in Ireland by a company called CC Hellenic. Whereas uh, I'm sure of you, you might guess what CC stands for when you mention Coca-Cola. Um, yeah, so what, uh, what's the price point of this? So it's currently on our website, I think, uh, 51, 52 euro. Uh, Norway and Ireland, it, it retails about 56 57 uh, we, For the whiskies that we have available in Ireland tonight, uh, I'm sorry if I'm doing a sales plug here, uh, they're all on the website at a discount tonight. So the 10 to 12 are about €5 Euro off. And then one of the whiskies actually don't have in the tasting that our own single cast is on the website. There's €20 Euro off that as well tonight. Uh, I'll put up a link shortly into the chat there um, to, to, to direct you to our website where they're a little bit a little bit of a discount there for you. If your order's over 100 euro, it's free shipping as well. And can I ask, um, is Highland Park still privately owned or is it owned by the bigger boys? Highland Park is owned by Edgerton. Edgerton are quite different in the way they do. So Edgerton is the likes of uh, McCallan and the likes of uh, Glen Rottis. But they, uh, the Highland Distillers, they do something quite differently where they are a, a large scale company, but they're actually attached to a charity. So they don't actually have a board of directors as such. Their profits are actually reinvested back into charities or into the business themselves. Uh, so they're a charitable fund. I couldn't think of the words for a second. They're a charitable fund uh, in how they operate their business. So to give you an example of what they do, uh, recently, obviously, McAllen spent £150 million pounds on the building of their new distillery. Within three years, Edgerton had invested that amount of money back into charities and into their charity partners while they were building that distillery. They spend uh, £60 million a year on their cast policy across all brands, such as Highland Park, McAllen, Glenrothes and Brugal Rum. In two years, they reinvested that money back into charity. So everything that they do, although they are a big, large-scale company, they are a charitable trust uh, that was set up in Scotland. So that's how they operate their business. So technically, for all our good and all our drinking right now, we're giving to charity at the same time. I'll drink more then. <laughs> so as we're looking at the 10-year-olds, uh, sorry, Paddy, this question you had in there, 40% ABV. So this is, like, for me, let me put it this way. This is where we're starting our night. This is where we're starting our journey right now. And if you can start a journey like this, you can only imagine where we're about to go. <laughs> but as we're talking about this 10-year-old and we're talking about Highland Park, we talk about that Viking soul. And that, I wanted to give you a feeling of what Highland Park is all about and about that Viking soul and why we proudly stand, proudly stand apart from a lot of others out there in, in, what, in what we do and the things that make Highland Park whiskey, Highland Park whiskey. And the three most important things for us are our location, the people that we have involved and the whiskey that we actually create. And in standing apart, to give you an idea of the location of Orkney, Orkney is the most northerly distillery in Scotland. So we sit high up on the north of Scotland, uh, up above Speyside, up above the Highland, uh, up above the Highlands. And it gives us quite a different kind of climate and different kind of way of making our whiskey. 
and it gives the colder kind of style of climate as well. So to give you an idea, there's 70 islands within the Orkney uh, Islands, uh, but only 21 of them are inhabited. The rest are all actually inhabited by sheep. Highland Park itself sits on Kirkwall, and Kirkwall will be the biggest island within it. Uh, you can fly to uh, Kirkwall, and um, it's the easiest way to get there, but it's quite a rocky kind of flight. And if you, if anybody's ever taken a flight to the Aran Islands on one of those dodgy old planes, you might not enjoy Kirkwall. It's even uh, it's even more scary as is. And actually, even you see the uh, the islands as they're set out. If you go up to the far further uh, northwest of uh, Orkney, and you have Westray there onto the next island, that is the shortest available commercial flight in the world. You're literally up in the air and you're coming straight back down again. Um, so these islands really create quite a different and original style of whiskey in the climate that we're working in. Orkney Islands are named after the Orca Whale. Uh, there's 21,000 people living across it. And I was saying only 21 islands are inhibited. It stretches over 380 square miles. And that gives you an idea of the beauty of this place. It's like looking at the West Coast in Ireland or going up to the Giant's Causeway. This gorgeous... Uh, fantastic scenery really has this whiskey really to encapsulate it and to be a part of it and to really create something quite special and something quite different. So as we're moving along and if anybody has any kind of thoughts don't be afraid to share them in the chat and, and as we go through our whiskies what we will kind of take a look at and it's kind of a quick jump in to our next whiskey to give you an idea of the changes that we can actually create and how we actually make things. So Moving on to our second whiskey, which would be our ambassador's choice. So Sebastian's asking if there's uh, any other distilleries in Orkney. Uh, Sebastian, there is. There's one called Scapa. It's a little just further south. It's on the same island Kirk, uh, as a uh, Highland Park, just a little further south. Um, uh, they make good whiskey as, as well, just not as good as Highland Park, though. Um, Scapa do make some beautiful liquid as well in fairness to them yeah it's, and it's more of a honeyed sort of flavour it's not really a peated whiskey it's not a coastal whiskey it's very honeyed um, yeah they, they really do play it with their sweetness and they really big up their, big up their sweetness in their stead probably where Highland Park has a bit more of a lighter kind of smoke style I, for me personally Scapa comes through a bit kind of heavier and a bit harsher through the sweetness in the whiskey as well Um. So as we look at this and we look at our ambassador's choice, it's such a shame. The reason this was chosen was to have Martin on this call. This was a whiskey that was chosen by Martin. And this is going to give us an idea of ABVs as well and how we kind of, like I say, the biggest difference makers for us are really our cast policy and our ABV in how we make our whiskies. So this was originally launched in Sweden and then it took a, a UK and a global release. I said it was created by Martin Max our global brand ambassador. Again, aged predominantly European sherry seasoned and uh, American oak casks. But by bringing up that 46% ABV, so we've jumped up 6% ABV on this. So when you get to this sort of high sort of volume as well, the one thing I'd recommend for people is don't, people have a habit of nearly thinking they're wine tasting or something and dumping their nose into a glass and taking a big whiff. That's really gonna start burning receptors in our nose and start kind of uh, causing an effect there. So what we we'll do is we're gonna take a small little pass and a small little sniff on it. We don't wanna get really deep in there. So already we're getting that kind of spicier note, we're getting that higher ABV. We're also getting a lot more flavor in this. For anybody who's kind of looking at or has looked at whiskeys to see when we're actually going to our bottling strengths and how we actually decide our bottling strengths. Um, this is where things get very kind of technical. When you look molecularly, when you look at ABV, and when you the molecules and molecular uh, structure of alcohol is very, very similar to the molecular structure and the molecules within aroma. So we try to go for a bottling strength. We age this whiskey at 69.8%, uh, which is quite a high ABV. Because of our climate, we need to have that little higher ABV to get that real impact with the wood and real impact with our climate. But when we go to our bottling strength, what happens is we hit a point where you go higher in ABV to really open up those phenol phenols and open up the aroma. But when we're doing this, we have to remember that we're making the whiskey itself stronger as well. So we need to find that balance where we want to get that big, bold aroma. We want to get those, those notes through. We want to make sure that it tastes really good as well. And that's always the balancing act that every whiskey mastery team, such as the ones in Highland Park, will have to toe that line to make sure that they're going to get that right sort of um, flavor from it while giving that good aroma. 
So although at forty six percent for me personally, I, I do say be careful in how you nose it. But like it doesn't burn, it doesn't come through very harshly. It's quite mellow in its style. It comes across as me as like a little bit of a sort of turbocharged ten year old essentially. You know. Yeah, one hundred percent. For me, the colour is a little bit kind of more amber, a little golder. Obviously, we're not adding as much water for our dilution. And on the on the first taste, I really get a lot more peat smoke. I really kind of get that coming through. 100%. Yeah. It, really, it does. It jumps out, doesn't it? It really jumps out. Um, and I think Declan was asking there earlier on, what, what is the, the, the sort of the peating levels in here? What's the PPM here? It's, it's not as big as people think it is. No, it's 38 to 45 PPM. Um, but what's quite different is, as we're talking about our malting, and we'll move on. We'll move on later on as we look at it. We are, as Michael said, we're one of the only actual distilleries that still malts our barley on site. But it's only about twenty percent of our malt that's actually um, peated. About eighty percent of our malt is unpeated. We, uh, like most distilleries in Scotland, we do get barley from Simpsons. Uh, we use a mix of uh, Lorette and the Uptick and a little bit of Concerto. But all the barley that we do malt is malted on site, uh, fresh with peat. Uh, but it's only about 20% of our actual final malt that is peated. So we get about 35 to 44 in our PPM. 38 to 45, excuse me. But on this one, really getting, for me, really getting that smoke, getting a bit sweeter, uh, really kind of getting more of a kind of a base kind of flavor. As, we're, as we've increased our ABV, we're getting more flavor from that distillate as well. So I do get those oats coming through, um, but you, you, I do get a lot more sweetness out of this as well, which is kind of a, a contradiction in itself as I'm getting smoke and sweet together, but for me, they're coming through. Ross is asking, is there, is there any whiskey you would add water to more than others? Or is it just a personal choice? To be honest, Ross, it pretty much is a personal choice. Um, I, I've, I've drank whiskey at cast strength and we have our own sort of Highland Park cast strength and it's 63 and a half percent and I've drank it quite easily and enjoyed it without any water and then tonight I was trying earlier on today I was trying some of the Highland Parks and I was like oh that one might just need a bit of water to open it up and it, it, it varies by your, your own taste the time of day you're drinking it and you know and, and the whiskey as well you know it's you, you, the, the best advice I can give is, is, is try the whiskey as it is, as it's bottled, whether it be cast strength or at 40%, 46 and then you make your own choice and your own decision. But at the same time, don't throw gallons of water into it, just put drops of water into it. At the end of the day, you know, you can put it in, you can't take it out. Uh, and I actually, I actually done it with uh, one of the Highland Parks earlier on today. I put too much water into it and I killed it. And I lost all the flavour of it. I was just tasting water. You know, so right. just be very careful when you're adding water to whiskey. You know, you can always add more. You know, you can't take that out. But whatever you do, don't add ice. <laughs> Frozen water, no. Um, well, ice, is, but there's other reasons behind the ice. We don't want to bring it too cold, but we want to add our dilution. And that's, it, it is, it's very much a personal choice. But as we're talking about that, we're talking about ABV. For what we add in water, we start to lose the aroma, but we open up other types of flavors as well. So it's always very interesting to add a little touch of water to something. If you were to talk to our, our expert whiskey making teams in Highland Park and in McAllen and Glenrothes, they'll generally taste at about 30% ABV because what they, they want to expunge the, almost the aromatic notes and they want to really get down to the bare bones body of the whiskey. So they'll to get a real kind of flavor of exactly how that's actually worked in the cask and how things have gone on they do bring it down to that low ABV to really get a good idea of the taste to know exactly what they're working with. So it's one of the, one of the greatest things about uh, Highland Park. And again, like King McCallan is, they have a whiskey mastery team that is constantly tasting, tasting, tasting as they go along. Like we're saying that our entry level with Highland Park is a 10 year old. From the first year whiskey goes into a barrel, it begins to be tasted. So when the first year that goes into a barrel, they're going to taste it just for the simplicity of making sure the barrel is actually working and doing its job and that there's been no leaks or anything like that. There's been no problems within the barrel because whiskey really is distilling and everything is a science, but making whiskey is nature and it's an art and it's understanding how the barrels interact. You could set down 10 barrels at exactly the same time and get totally different flavors coming from it. So in the first year, they're going to test it to make sure that that barrel is interacting. 
on the third year, they're going to test it again to see exactly what kind of flavor progression it's actually created. On the seventh year, they'll taste it again and they'll know where it's gone from the third. They keep these records. So generally from the seventh year, they have an idea in their own heads. They're like, okay, that's going to be a 10-year-old. That's going to be a 12-year-old. That's going to be great for 18. Or that has literally skyrocketed beyond something I've never seen. We're going to do something really special with that. And that's really where you see with Highland Park and we see the likes of the Triskillian and the Twisted Tattoo, the 16-year-old, where we see real kind of progress in the barrels and we see something quite special happening. We went, right, this, this can't be our normal. This has to be something different. And it's that, and that's what I was talking about. We don't generally change our mash bill and what we do. It's the aging process that creates something so different and something so interesting because it is nature and we let nature do its thing. And that creates our brand and creates our whiskies and creates our liquids for what we're actually going to sell and what we're going to make. And that's, that creates everything that we do in, in how we make our whiskey. Did you say that your entry as a the first kind of whiskey you get as a 10 year old or, or is there kind of three year olds there as well or or is, it, is 10 the first 10 year old is the general in our core range there have been special releases at younger age you can actually even go onto right. the uh, website and buy even a new make if you'd like to give it a go personally i love new makes um but 10 year old is the is the entry in our core range only again if something is really special and really kind of takes flavor and really interacts we might release something as a special edition younger but from our core, 10 year old is our youngest. So one of the prizes tonight is actually some new make spirit from Highland Park. Um, the, because there's no Vikings here tonight, nobody's dressed as a Viking. So we'll have to redistribute our prizes over the evening to, to, uh, to other people. But um, at, at the moment, the first prize is going to Mike Kasarik because of uh, the best haircut in lockdown. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a no brainer. I just have to figure out how to get it over to you in California, but we'll figure a way out to do that, Mike. So. Mike, you I'm going to tell you now. I, I read the email wrong. I thought it said best hiking costume. <laughs> well, you can take a hike then, can't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway. Next time. So, Mike, I've got a lovely Highland Park uh, tasting glass for you. And you. uh, you're also I, going to I play actually have some uh, friends in Dublin, Sean Reese and Laura. I don't know ah. if you know them, but uh, you can, you can give it to them and, and they can hold it for me safely. So we can give them the glass, but do you want me to give them the whiskey? Because you, you've also won, uh, ah. we, you've won 100 mil. We do like small bottles, 100 mil measures of our single cast. So you've won 100 mil of that as well. So that was the, the first prize was a glass in our 100, 100 mil of our own whiskey and also 100 mil of the new make spirit. So you've won that. I, I, I reckon if you give that to Sean, he's going to drink it all on you. So, um, I trust Sean more than I think I should, but we'll work something <laughs> out. Thank you very much. It's very generous. Well, congratulations. You, you've won our first prize tonight. Uh, we've got a few more uh, as we go along this evening. Um, a few more of our uh, 100ml single cast to dish out so lots of people can try it and uh, other bits and pieces as we go along. But um, Alan, that, 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 them first two whiskies were really good to me. Both 10-year-olds, but both very different, you know? Yeah. And it really shows you how we can be different and how things, you might think a 10-year-old is a 10-year-old, but there could be even 6% of an ABV can create such a massive difference in the flavour. Yeah. Uh, stuff. I've also realised something as well, Michael, just taking a quick look through the chat there. Everybody's uh, very on the ball when they spot my spelling mistakes as I go. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy, I don't know what you found out in Ornage is, but I don't think I want to know either, when I, especially when it was Urban Dictionary that brought it up. <laughs> that is I thought, it was, I yes. thought it, was a, it was like some herb or gorse that grew on Orkney. <laughs> just to them, you know. I suppose, yeah, the OR probably would, would make you pick it. No, but it, it is orange. It is that citrus. It is that sweetness. You could have just left. Everybody will be on Urban Dictionary uh, at the oh. break right here, you know? <laughs> Why did you I just lie down and tell us it's a rare one from Orkney? We would have believed you. i tell you one thing, though. I'm panicking. I, I really want to, like, stop this right now and go ahead and make sure none of my spell. <laughs> Anyway. A whiskey novice, so I thought, all right, that's that's a, that's a whiskey term. I'll, I'll let them at it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, like them first two whiskeys are excellent. Shall we move on to our third whiskey? Because this is this is one that I haven't had, and as a Highland Park fan, this is something I really want to try. And uh, I don't think it's readily available. It, it was a, a limited expression. It pops up now and again. You can find it here and there, uh, but it's very very different. And that's the the dark origins and. Uh, Comes in yeah. a lovely black bottle, you know, it's not a full bottle. This is um, 
I love I love whiskey packaging black black bottles, but when you're decanted into small bottles, you never know how much is <laughs> in the bottom. So you never know. Like, you're like, oh no. So you're holding back a little bit. So if somebody who got smaller samples than you should be, I'm very sorry, but I just didn't know what was in the bottle. I still don't know what's in the bottle. I know there's something in there. There's a little jingle there, you know. And that's where I, that, as as you said yourself, Michael, being former bartenders, like we also hate stock takes with them as well. <laughs> It's a stock taker's nightmare, isn't it? Because you can't Absolutely. see anything. Yeah. Absolutely. So as we talk about the dark origins, we're, g- we're going to put a bit of perspective onto that as well. And to give you the story of a man called Magnus Eunson. Magnus Eunson in 1798, he was a flesher by day. So he was actually um, a butcher as such and a beadle by night. So he was actually a member of the church. Um, be- flesher and beadle by day. So he was a butcher and a member of the church by day, but a smuggler by night. And what he actually did was he became a member of the church to hide his activity in distilling. Uh, so nobody would actually catch him. So in 1798, he began this. And he was later on caught um, in, his, in his smuggling and in his uh, illegal distilling. In uh, 1816, he was caught in his legal distilling and his uh, enterprise business. And he was arrested and uh, sent to jail. Uh, it was then six years later that the local sheriff at the time that actually caught him started back up the distillery in High Park, in the High, in Highland Park. And uh, he was able to begin the distillery. And when Magnus was actually released from prison, he went back to working in the actual legal distillery now instead of the illegal one. So the Dark Origins for Highland Park, it's, it's a brand new core bottle that came about. And it's actually a celebration of Magnus Eusen's illicit distilling. Uh, and this was quite a different kind of style of whiskey. So we've actually changed things up here. It's a 46.8%. So we've gone a little bit higher in our ABV. Uh, and we've got a different kind of connection with our within our barrels. So we're in a, a majority uh, first fill European oak, about 60% first fill European oak, about 20% uh, first fill American oak. And then we're about 20%, 20% of refill sherry barrels as well. And that combination of American and European, uh, they don't really let it know, but it's 20%. So it's 80% new fill, 20% refill. And the high majority comes to our European uh, oak, our first fill sherry. So on the nose, straight away, again, it's something that amazes me. And like, if for anybody that was on the distilled call, we've seen um, the, the Mulligan's um, single cask and they had their, their cast strength uh, release on it and it's something that amazed me with Highland Park and it's down to that aging process and the, to, the, to the climate that actually affects it and the mellowness that it brings is when we get to the high ABV it doesn't catch you it doesn't give you a big bang you don't get that large kind of ethanol kind of smell off it it is quite subtle in its nose but what we are getting from this is we're getting fantastic colour coming from those casks. So we started working with sherry, and one of the big things sherry actually brings and why we look at sherry casks, they were one of the original casks that were used in whiskey aging because they were the most kind of readily available. Sherry and port were the two first in Ireland and Scotland because they were the most readily available. They were the easiest to get, but they really defined what was happening in aging and distilling at the time and what brought around the flavors within these beers. But that sherry, what it does is it brings us totally different styles of flavors. So with our barrels, they're toasted barrels. They're not charred barrels. So we're not going to get those dark sugars we talk about in Irish whiskey and bourbons. We're not getting those vanillas. We're not getting those creme brulees, those caramels. What we're getting is kind of dried fruits. We're getting raisins, dates, figs, kind of noses coming from this and kind of flavor. And that kind of gives us more of a kind of a different sort of style. But with these types of barrels, with that, with that refill, we, are, we do give another kind of run on the, char, on the toast on the barrel. So we do open up a few more of those sugars. So that's where this comes quite differently. So we get that vanilla, we get that kind of cinnamon, and we're getting a little bit of ginger through this. You're right about the color, Alan. It's very, like, when you line up the eight bottles, like in the miniature size that everybody's got, it's the one that stands out color-wise because it's, boom, it's there. I, I looked at myself when I was bottling it, and I'm like, wow. That really stands out. And for me, you've got such a fantastic colour. One, one thing was like, why did they put it in a black bottle? Why not show off this beautiful colour? Normally you put the things in a dark bottle to hide the colour. And this is a beautiful thing, you know. It's, it's a beautiful whiskey. Really, that, that sherry influence is there. And, you know, it's just 
you know, lots of spiciness there, lots of cinnamon, ginger, you know, it's, it's not it, like your typical sherry sort of whiskey as you'd think it would be, you know? No, and it's, it's, it, you're getting different notes coming from that refill. And obviously, like, that colour comes quite from the, the high ABV as well. And another thing that we're very proud of in Highland Park is that we are 100% natural colour. What you're getting is the colour of the whiskey leaving our barrels. There are a lot of distilleries out there who will use uh, E25 e, e, e or what's known as caramel in, in colouring their whiskey. We are 100% natural colour. So everything you're seeing from us is the colour of our, of our liquids. And it's the colour... Um, as the colour of our actual whiskey coming from our barrels. So that colour is really coming from that higher ABV, we've got less dilution going on, and we've got that full natural colour coming from our barrels. So it's a really, a really, really nice dram. Um, this is the first, this is actually the first time I've tried this. Um, and I'm, glad laugh, it, it? I'm glad there's a couple more samples just sitting over here, I may have for later on this evening. Um, well, Alan, the, the, the hard thing now, right, is because my favourite whiskey of all time, my number one whiskey in the world has to follow this. How, how, do, how, how do we do it? I don't know how we do that. I'm, I'm probably just going to take a break for 10 minutes here, you know, let, let you get on with it. Because I think that, you know, it's not going to put it to shame, if you know what I mean, but it's just this very different flavour profile. So if anybody, once you've enjoyed this whiskey, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend having a, a glass of water or cleanse your palate, you know, so it doesn't cloud your judgment on your next whiskey, which for me, it's like someone who works in the whiskey industry, you get asked a lot of time, what's your favourite whiskey? And a lot of people in the whiskey industry go, oh Jesus, I've been asked that question again. Because you're chasing and trying so many whiskies, it's, it's, it can be a hard question to answer. It's not hard for me, because our next whiskey is number one, hands down, my favourite whiskey in the world. And if anyone asks me what my favourite whiskey is, I'll tell them this is what it is because it's phenomenal. And it's price point, it's readily available. It ticks all these boxes, you know. It, from, you know, There's lots of single cast whiskies that come out and we have our own one of Highland Park, which is great, but that won't be around in five years time. Whereas this will be, you know, and that's the beauty of a whiskey that should be one of your favorite whiskies in the world, should be price accessibility and readily available. And, you know, that's for me what becomes what should be one of your favourite whiskies, and this has been one of my favourite whiskies for over twenty years now, um, and it still will be in another twenty years, as long as the Highland Park keep producing it. And you, geez, Michael, you're really loving this. You're putting the pressure on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, Michael is correct. Like, and this is, and that, you, you might be able to see, start to see a few patterns going on, and how I'm kind of bringing us through this as well. And the twelve-year-old, which Michael's thinking about, which we're going to try next, really is the epitome of our decision. And that's what we start to talk about distillery. So the distillery itself, founded by Magnus Hewson on the Hillier A, known as High Park, specifically so he could actually keep an eye on tax collectors and would-be customers actually coming into Kirkwall. He had the highest kind of vantage point over the, over the coast, so he knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what was happening. So this is the site of our distillery. And since then, not much has changed. The Highland Park distillery uh, has been for over 220 years. Uh, about in the... 80s, when they really kind of went from looking at blended malts to single malts, they doubled the capacity of the size of the distillery because they knew they'd be looking at the, the, the amount of volume that would be coming out in the distillery and what they had to do. So now we hope we sit with um, washbacks of 30,000 litres. We sit with a wash still of 20,000 litres and spirit stills of 9,000 litres with the ability to uh, push out about 2.5 million litres of whiskey a year coming out of our distillery. Um, and they've managed to increase it to that size to try and create something quite special and something quite different and to be able to keep up with the volume and keep up with what we were doing. Uh, before we move on, Michael, do we back in the chat? Uh, no, just a little bit about just seeing how nice the, the previous whiskies were. Uh, someone's asking about the dark bottle due to production batch variation. It may possibly, yeah, uh, probably not. Not really with Highland Park. It's probably more about branding more than anything. Um, they like to do these things, they like to do cool branding, and in fairness, Highland Park do do cool branding. Um, other than that, no, there's nothing, nothing major there. Someone's asking what type of sherry oak is used, but it's not really sherry oak, it's, it's seasoned sherry. Uh, the American bourbon casks get sherry put into them to season them, so they flavour the bourbon casks with sherry as well. Um, so, and there are, obviously, sherry casks come from Spain as well, from the European oak side of things there. 
Um, yeah, and so, the way, isn't it, Alan? so what 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 happens with our cast? And to give you a kind of story about our cast is is that we spoke about Stuart McPherson. So we have a gentleman called Stuart McPherson. He's called our master of wood. Like if you could ever think of a job in the world and have a title, master of wood could be a title. <laughs> His job is literally to source the wood for our casks and then he'll go down to Televesa where our cooperages are, where they make our uh, casks for us and they sherry season. Sherry season them for 18 months and we use two different types of styles. And we're going to talk about the wood styles in a little bit and you'll see a little bit more into it but we use American oak and European oak, and they both deliver totally different flavors, uh, flavor choice, flavor impacts on our whiskey. But with these types of flavor impacts and with what we're doing and our choice of wood, we do create something quite special again in what we do, where we're one of the only actual distilleries in the world where we're creating these sherry season casks, like we're talking about for 18 months, where we actually rent, we, sorry, we rent the sherry off of the sherry houses in Televesa to season our casks. So most people would actually go down and they like buy the casks or rent the casks to the sherry houses. We actually rent the sherry from them to season our casks. And we're gonna make sure we're gonna get the best sherry we can. So Televesa would be one of our uh, sherry houses which we use in Jerez. Um, and it really creates a different sort of, it, it, we found that it's one of the best impacts and one of the best sherry houses that we can use for our casks. And as we, as we talk again, we're going to see more kind of barrel impacts and more kind of cask impacts as we go. So when we're looking at our production, as we were already talking about, to give you an idea of really where our 12-year-old and what, what it comes from, is we take in our barley and we, steep, and we start steeping our barley to, what, to wet it, to create our germination, to put it onto our malting floors and our kiln. So we see everything is actually done by hand as well. It's not even that we're actually malting our own barley. Uh, we're actually, what I was saying, one of seven earlier is we're one of seven that actually do it by hand still in Scotland to this day. And you can see here our malting floors where we soak our barley, they lay it out to let it germinate. We're starting to convert our, uh, our starches into our sugars before it goes up into our higher rooms, into our malting kilns. And our malting kilns is really where we start to impart our flavor. We start to play our flavor of our special type of peat and our peat coming from Hobbiston Moor. We then move along after into our malt bins. So we're saying our 20,000 uh, litre capacity washbacks. And to create that, as we're talking about, we were talking about our barley. So the difference that we actually, uh, not our barley, our peat. The difference in our peat is we have three layers of peat. We have our fog, our yarfi, and our moss. This is a woodless peat. So saying there's no trees in the area. It's a lot of heather. It's a lot of light kind of flavours coming through our peat. So that's what you're going to get in our smoke. And I know we kind of said, we can't wait for you to have the 12 year old and I'm really trying to build up anticipation right now. But to give you an idea of that 12 year old and to give you the flavors that are coming through, um, these actual bogs themselves have been growing or they've been decomposing, whatever you want to call it, forming for 3000 years. So we talk about the fact that we want to make a 12 year old. Making a 12 year old for us is about 18 years of work because we have six years choosing our trees to let them grow, 12 years of letting it age, but we've 3,000 years behind us and letting this peat form to create this original style of light, heather, honey, sweet style of peat. And we move into our 12 year old. So this was the first proprietary distillery release, launched in 1979. So this is coming from the original recipe that was created by Magnus Jensen, and this is one of the first whiskey that was actually made by the distillery. And like Michael was talking, like this is his favorite. And like to put that little bit in about the distillery to give you an idea, is, this is the epitome of what we do. This, if you ever told anybody what Highland Park do I want to try, this is the one I'd reach for every time. Like Michael made a good point on the 10 year old. If you wanted somebody starting out that never tried it, that don't want to pay too much, but want to get an idea, they go to the 10 year old. If you want to see everything the Highland Park is about, the 12 year old is where you start. I'm just looking at that previous slide there, and there was three parts to the the peat. Yeah. One of them part was part of the peat was fog. Yeah. Uh, so that's I'm I'm in every single bottle of Highland Park. Fogarty is in every single bottle of Highland Park. <laughs> you are. I'm, epic. I'm absolutely delighted. I knew I was going to be mentioned somewhere on this tasting, and I'm in the peat. I'm part of the peat. I'm a layer of peat. So that is all my come come. All my family members that have died over the last 3,000 years are in there somewhere, you know. 
I'm in. I knew. I knew there was something there. You knew there was something special about it. <laughs> and when we talk about this, we talk about this release. We spoke about the ten-year-old. And for me, it's always interesting that even the way they do things in Highland Park is there's a story behind what they're doing as well. Where the ten-year-old was our Viking scars. This is our Viking honor. So this is in honor to the Vikings, to that heritage in Orkney. And this is why they, this is why they have this whiskey. It's in honor to Magnus Eunson. It's in honor to this distillery that was founded in 1979. And it's in honor to that Viking heritage for this whiskey. Coming back down to that 40% ABBV, we're getting a bit of a lighter nose, getting a little more sweeter. I really get that kind of heather honey peat that I was talking about. So well balanced. I, I get a little bit of juicy fruits here, you know, that it's on their taste of that sort of civil orange comes through. I think I'd seen a comment from somebody previously or one or two comments about Christmas cake. Like to me, this is that definition of you want to light your Christmas pudding. I, I'd never be a man that would, uh, okay, uh, wasting alcohol and lighting it on fire. But really this, you get that rich fruit cake kind of note. You're getting those winter spices. Oranges are spelled properly this time for anybody that wants to check. <laughs> But we've got a Seville orange, so we've got a more of a sweeter sort of style. But this really, to me, this is Christmas in the glass, personally. It gives you all those notes, those spices, those fruits. This is probably the longest that I've ever known the Highland Park 12-year-old. Normally at this stage, the glass is empty. <laughs> I, 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 I'm very much, I drink whiskey in pubs more than at home. But in the last six months, obviously, that's changed. So my, my, my go-to bar in Dublin is Bose. Everybody knows that. And uh, when I order a Highland Park 12-year-old in Bose, they don't give me a single measure. They just give me a double straight away because they know I'm going to order another one straight after. So they're like, just give him a double. He's always going to... I don't even have to ask for it now. So, in fact, I'm scared to ask for a Highland Park in Bose now because, one, it dents the wall and you, you, you think you're just drinking one whiskey, but really you're drinking two. Uh, but working from home now is a, a, a sort of... probably saved my pocket a little bit there. Although I'm still drinking as much Highland Park as normal. Sorry, the point about the Christmas cake was not that you pour it on it and set fire to it, but you drink it with the Christmas cake. Oh, probably a better idea, yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <out there. laughs> Um A couple of questions coming through there and a couple of notes. Uh, Paul Rogers. You're correct. We do mature in Orkney. We also do because uh, we want to keep that climate where we bottle in Glasgow as a part of Edmonton. Uh, with a unique piece, could we use terroir as a concept? You, you can't really use terroir as a concept because it's not within our green. So it's not a natural kind of forming to impact flavour in that sort of way. If you had it in the grain, if the grain was grown there and it was grown on that sort of land, we could dictate terroir as something. But because it's coming from the peat, it's a little bit different. I suppose it's not a physical kind of ingredient, if you wanted to call it that, within the whiskey. It's kind of a flavor enhancer of the whiskey. But it's a very good question. Uh, Declan, with your little eco head. <laughs> um, how sustainable is a burning 3,000 year peat from an island? Um, very sustainable. The, the, the bog that it is, like, I'm a, I'm a rural man from Galway. I grew up in bogs so I can speak about bogs. Uh, the bog that it is is quite large and there's another three plots that are just the size of the one that we're using right now. So there's no danger of the peat running out at any time and it's all a similar landscape. So of course, again, we're looking at nature. Every stretch of bog is going to be different, but that's going to be like every cut of turf can be different. So uh, I suppose there's the Irishmen say we call it turf, not peat. But everything that we cut can be different as we go. So we're always going to have that consistency within our flavour of using that uh, high heather floral kind of piece. I think we're lucky with that, Alan, uh, is that the, the peat bog on Orkney has a lot more life in it. Um, like, you know, if you go to like the island of Isla, where the, there's a lot of peat used, and you know, it's eventually, you know, whether it's in our life, but it may run out. You know, there's only really four peat bogs in Scotland that are used in whiskey production. You know, one in Orkney, one in Isla, <coughs> and two in the Highlands of Scotland. So there's not a lot of peat out there and the, the, the peat flavour, people are enjoying it more. So there's more more joining in, more people drinking peated whiskey now as opposed to like 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's become a thing, it's become, people love it, you know. So at some stage, you know, in fairness, the Orkney bogs probably won't run out. But at some stage along the lines, we're going to have to look at that from a sustainability cycle and say, right, we already have it in Ireland, so we... You can't be burning this on your fire now. You can't be doing that. 
you know, and th- th- that's sort of stopping in Ireland. There's more like sort of smokeless fuels coming in. And it's going to sort of happen in the whiskey industry as well. They're going to have to figure out a way to make, you know, hypothetically, one block of peat would flavor a million bottles. That one block of peat is going to have to flavor two million bottles, but still deliver the same sort of result. So efficiency is going to come into it, and industry and technology will definitely play a part. You know, but it's something I ask uh, when we do talk, we've done a couple of talks with Paul from Arbeg. It's always saying, look, where, where, where is this going to go here? Because eventually, you know, maybe not in our lifetime, it could run out, you know? Oh, 100%. And that's obviously anything that we use naturally, you're always going to have that risk. And with uh, Orkney, they do have, like, as you see, we got it's 70 islands, 21 of them are inhabited. So there is a massive array of, like, just desolate land out there, which would be quite natural bog anyway. So there's no danger of running it out there. But, like, we see it in Ireland. We have been limited to our use of peace. We see bogs closing, we see problems happening all the time. So it is it is a real kind of threat and a real thing to worry about. Most likely not in our lifetime, but like anything environmentally, it's probably not in our lifetime, but it's something we have to start thinking about now to affect a change for the future. Like we can enjoy all the scotch we want, but you know, like our will our kids, kids, kids be able to enjoy that scotch? Now I know this com- this argument is always brought about for a lot of other reasons. Sustainability in the environment, I don't think it's about um really enjoying whiskey but we want everybody to be able to enjoy their whiskey as well exactly um so we just had our fourth fourth whiskey we'll have, we'll have a short break in a second but i'm going to give out another prize there i was, I was scrolling across the top of the screen there and uh someone actually did uh have a, a little viking hat on and i think it was in the, the irish tricolor so uh, gwen devins uh, i'm gonna send you 100 mil of our single cast whiskey um, I'm guessing it's under. I know everybody joins our tastings by name at this by just looking at their order names and not their numbers now. So I'm guess, guessing that's under Ronan Devins. So uh, Ronan and Gwen, we're going to send you 100 mil. But, uh, Gwen, I seen you wearing the hat, not him. So he doesn't <laughs> get the whiskey, okay? You get the whiskey and you get to drink it. And you, you can let him have a sniff of it, you know? But you get to drink it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to send you out 100 mil there. Of our single cask. So thanks everybody. It's uh, we're just at half time. Uh, it's 22 minutes past eight. So we will reconvene the bang on 2030, half past eight. So we'll give you eight minutes to just have a comfort break. Maybe get some more water. Uh, we've got a good few more lovely whiskies coming up. Uh, the first half was great. The second half is going to be a belter. Yeah, guys, we'll scan. see you all shortly. Thank you. Actually, five minutes. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, and we'll crack on with our second half with our next four whiskies. Um, and like I said earlier on, if you enjoyed the first half, the second half is just going to be even more amazing. Um, I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I'm getting to revisit an old whiskey that um, our next whiskey is something that I'll be revisiting. I haven't had it for a long time. And the only reason it's in the tasting tonight is... Um, during lockdown, I decided to uh, tidy my house a little bit in the spare room, and uh, I found a case of six bottles of this in the spare room that I'd been I'd obviously snuggled away a couple of years ago when it was re-released, and I put it aside and completely forgot about it. And uh, so when I was tidying up the house, I, I found this, and I was like, "Hmm." So uh, I knew that at some stage we were always going to have a Highland Park tasting this year, so I kept a few bottles back for that, um, but drank the rest because uh, it's, it's a fantastic whiskey. So our next four whiskies we're going to drink in this order. It'll be Highland Park 15-year-old, followed by Twisted Tattoo, and then it'll be Triskelion, and then the 18-year-old. Okay, so that's our next four whiskies. Alan, I'm going to hand it back over to you. You've got something going on the screen here for us. Yeah, just a small little look at the guys actually out footing the turf, cutting the turf uh, by hand as they do on the island. It's actually interesting that there's only a two to three month window, as in like here, to actually go out into the bog and do it. So um, it's a job by that done by the guys in the distillery. So more or less, a lot of the island are employed by the distillery. And they'll literally leave the distillery over that two to three months and they'll go out and they'll cut the turf and they'll turn it and they'll foot it and make sure everything is all right. Um, and get the job done so they kind of all kind of chip in on it um okay so welcome back 
That's a very labour-intensive job, isn't it? Cutting the turf, it's, it's like just back-breaking work, isn't it? Absolutely. I spent many, many a summer doing it back at home. <laughs> I tried it once, never again. <laughs> I've done it for five minutes, and I got one, I got one little block, and I went, that's grand. Thanks very much. I enjoyed that, but never again. <laughs> <laughs> you can always tell the lads at home that didn't go to the, to the bog, they had the nice hands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, in, in my youth back, I lived on a farm in Scotland just outside of Dundee. And in my youth, uh, we picked strawberries in the summer. And that was it. So, yeah, I, I, had, I had picking hands. And that was just all you done was pick strawberries, put them in punnets and sent them off to the supermarkets. So um, I, all, I, I grow strawberries in my allotment every year. And all, every time I go to pick them, I reminisce. And I'm like, this is so much easier than when I had to, when I had to pick 100 metres straight, you know? I just have to pick this little bunch in front of me, and it's great fun. But it always, it always haunts, haunts me that yeah, I had to. You'd be picking a hundred meters, and you get out of that, and then you have to go and do another hundred meters. You know, yeah. if you're not going fast enough. You're, you're getting told off by the farmer. Come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. You know, you're, you're going too slow there. You know. Well, I, I could tell you very easily, Michael. You might look back and reminisce about your picking strawberries. I get PTSD from looking at a bog. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually really interesting when you talk about uh, to, to, side, to side gauge, but another story. When we look at the history of whiskey in Scotland and how Scotch whiskey came about and how it came to be, uh, what actually started with uh, the whiskey distillation and what made it quite big and why we had our kind of localized distilleries when they first started was it was local farmers would start distilling. So you had everybody. Um, growing their crops for the year, but they would have leftover crop. You might have one farmer who wasn't, who didn't grow as much, but he had his animals take care of his family. He had to make money. He was a distiller. So the local farmers in the area would actually bring their grain to him to distill. Now, there was no aging process here. It was the, a rough kind of new make to more of a style, like a style of putting at the time. But what they were making is that he'd actually take so if I walked in tomorrow and I said, right, here's the, like, two bags of grain. I need you to make me some whiskey to keep me warm during the summer. He'd take about a, bo- a, a bag and three quarters and make my liquid. But he'd keep a quarter of the grain for himself, to, for his family and for his, farm, for his farm animals and everything else. And that's actually what helped grow whiskey distillation in Scotland was this kind of almost helping each other out. But the local distiller being that person for everybody to actually take advantage of and give it to use. So as Michael was talking about, the next whiskey we're going to move on to, it's, it's, for me, it's interesting, like I said, only being with uh, Highland Park for two years, it was one of the liquids that I could find the least amount of information as I went and as I was talking to people. But we have the 15-year-old. Now, we've got a flip here as we talk about the 15-year-old. Uh, this was an exclusive UK release in 2003. It was stopped. It was restarted again in 2016, and it's been slowed again uh, in its make. Where we were talking about... European oak. This is majority uh, American oak. So a little bit different and we're going to get different kind of flavor tones out of this that we would have got from our 12 and from our 10 and from our previous whiskeys. So 40% ABV again. So lighter in its notes and lighter in its flavor in its aroma. Um, but we get a nice kind of color coming from the fact that it's been in barrel for 15 years. And on the taste, For me, I get a, a lighter kind of note, but I get a lot more kind of oiliness, a lot more kind of citrusy, the toast and malt coming through. Um, still, we're getting that peat obviously coming through. I get a little bit of a kind of sweetness. I call it red currants. Um, it's the kind of sweet, it's, it's what my memory, it's what my mind kind of goes to when I taste it, is that red currant. I'm sure everybody's got a different type of name for it. But it's, it's another kind of different sort of flavor and it's another kind of profile that we're getting out of here. Now we were talking about barrels and it's actually going to be our next step. So as we drink this whiskey, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these and about our casks and how our cask caramelization really makes a big difference to us and how the difference in the type of wood that we use makes a big difference in our flavor. So what we can see here is we have just kind of a little kind of uh, supply chain for how we get our casks. So like I was talking about, we take our American oak and we take our European oak. So our European oak coming from, coming from lots of different places. Like I said, we have Stuart who's going to be sourcing the wood for us. And like we were saying, like to create a whiskey, it's six years of work just to get to the barrel. 
uh, just to get the barrel to the distillery because he's going to source the wood, he's going to look at the trees, he's going to get the trees to Yarez. They're going to leave the, they're going to cut down the trees, they're going to leave the wood to dry for a little while to make sure that it's the right kind of seasoning on it. Uh, they're then going to fill it for 18 months. Then we're going to ship it up to Orkney. And by the time we use it in Orkney, it takes a little bit of oil as well. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. But the types of wood that we use make a big, big difference in how we actually make our casts. And they actually make a big difference and impact to our flavor. So here we have, look, just kind of look at the barrels, but the different types of oak that we use. So when we talk about American oak and European oak, we talk about sherry in general. Sherry is going to deliver those dried fruits that we spoke about. It's going to deliver those raisins. It's going to deliver those sultanas. But the type of wood dictates the type, of the, the, the intensity and the body of the flavor. So when using this, this is predominantly American oak, where previously we were tasting predominantly European oak. And this brings a different type of flavor. So American oak being um, Quercus rober, European oak being Quercus alba. And that's the genus of wood that we use. If you think, so if you think about trees, I don't know, has anybody ever been? It's, it's a very random question. Has anybody ever been in like one of the great kind of national parks in America? Obviously we have people here from America who probably have. Um, but you see an American oak tree. American oak trees stand tall. They stand skinny. They, they go straight up. When an acorn falls in the, in the forest in America, in, in the, one of these type of woodlands, it hits the ground, the tree starts to grow but you've got a massive canopy in the woods. So that tree needs to get up to that canopy as fast as it can so it grows straight, tall, and strong. And it gets straight up there as fast as it can. European oak trees have a little bit more width to them. They grow outward. And what that's gonna create is, and you can see kind of cross sections on a microscope on our wood, the American oak, the gaps in the wood are smaller. So we get a lot more, less permeation in our wood, where the European oak is a little bit more stretched out. So even if I go back, here you can see the trees as they're left on their side and we can see the different kind of you can see in the bottom one you can see those kind of the rings you can see the slits coming out of the trees in the middle one you can see it's a little bit tighter that's our different styles of wood and that's what's actually going to create our wood styles for us and that creates our flavor so in this whiskey we're talking about a predominant american oak that predominant american oak isn't giving us as much full bodiness as we would have got from the other whiskies it's given us more of those kind of, uh, I said the lemon and orange kind of citrusy kind of oily kind of notes. It's not giving us maybe that full bodied kind of flavor. It's, it's a, it, it has, for a 15 year old, if you compare it to like our 12 year old, I doubt anybody has much of a 12 year old left to compare it, but it's a little bit lighter in its color because we haven't had that soak, we haven't had that permeation in the wood to create that difference. So what do we think of the 15? What, what do we, Michael, what do you think? There's nobody on top of him. Mute himself there. All right, no problem. We'll take a look in the chat there. What are people saying? Sorry, I was, I had it on yourself on mute there. It's, um, you're expecting more from it being a 15 year old, but flavor wise, it's a little bit less than the, the 12. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just the, the, the way it is. It's, it's, it's a different makeup. It's a different wood structure going on there. And as you've, you've highlighted that there, and it's a different whiskey. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a different animal, you know. Um, for me, and the 12-year-old exuberates a lot more flavor and a lot more different character. This is a more lighter style of whiskey, but, you know, it's, it's almost one of these things that you should, should say that so age doesn't really matter in a whiskey. You know, it's what you do with the, the maturation here and how you, what different barrels you use and what you create to make a great whiskey. And it is a great whiskey, just in a very different way. And if you, you know, if you did have some of the 12 year olds to compare them, it'd be actually amazing because they're very, very different, you know. But it's always been one of my go-to whiskies because it's always the one that you think about in Highland Park. I've always thought, I think about this when I have it because it's, is very different to my go-to Highland Park. I'm expecting it to, to come up another level as in 12 year old, three years older, but it's not that. There's a different makeup in the wood there, what's going on, and it's really different. And it's, and it's very enjoyable. It's very refreshing. You know, it's almost like an aperitif style whiskey, you know? 
really really light i find it very smooth very like and i think somebody says it there that it might be dangerous to open a bottle very easy to drink um a uh, question there it is at the same strength it's at 40 percent again and um, so it does have that th- but it, it shows you like people think even as you said it there michael it's 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 about the wood and how you're looking at it but like people say sherry cask but now we've seen the difference between an american sherry and a european sherry so sherry is can be a lot of things to a lot of people and it's how you use that flavor and influence that flavor um and how you use those barrels to create your flavor profile can be so different so like when we talk about people talk about wines and they talk about grape variety like different grape variety at the same grape variety can give 20 different tastes a sherry barrel is not just a sherry barrel whether it's a Quercus Alba, Quercus Rover, or even use an Irish oak, like a Quercus Citra, you get a totally different flavor profile of it. You're right. And that's, that's the good thing. Like, there's so many different varieties of sherry as well. You know, could you imagine if we um, seen someone in like a Scotch whiskey company going, right, we're going we're gonna to mature this or finish this whiskey in an Irish whiskey barrel. Oh, hell would break loose in Ireland. What whiskey barrel is it? You know, is it a peated whiskey? Was it a non-peated whiskey? Was it a pot still whiskey? Oh, we need to know. We need to know. And the, the Scotch whiskey company would just go, yeah, it was an Irish whiskey barrel. You know, so it, it's like there's different, you know, there's different structures. There's American oak, there's, there's sherry, the European oak, the, the sherry goes into it, the different types of sherry. Like fino sherry, it's, there's no fino in this, but, you know, or also Jimenez, you know, Amontillados. There's so many different flavour profiles going on, you know. And like you see even what Irish whiskey, the likes of the red breast with the Lustau, like totally different flavour profile again. Yeah. And that's sherry. And it's not, it's sherry houses. Everything that comes into it can be so influential to the flavour. But it's great that we have, that we can do this, and we have these different options, create these different flavour profiles. And, you know, I, I love different sherries. I love different American oaks and European oaks. I think it's brilliant. I know that a lot of people, in, especially in Ireland at the moment, we're, we're delving into beer casks and all that at the moment. And you know, I'm, I'm a bit 50-50 on that, you know, because these are these casks have worked for hundreds of years. And that's what makes great whiskey. I wonder how the beer cask thing is going to progress and how it's going to develop. I hope it develops really well. I've had some really amazing ones. I've had some really not so good ones. But um, you know, it's it's amazing like, how much flavors we can create from just one wooden barrel, essentially. You know, it comes down to everything. Like, so it's, it's even the fact that we're toasting. We're not, as we spoke already, we're toasting, yeah. we're not charring. We're not creating those burnt sugars. We're letting nearly. We're just burning it enough to let the wood make the wood permeable to let that sherry just soak through a little bit to really impact the flavor that we get. And as we've talked and as we said at the very start of this, like where we keep our mash bill quite similar, but it's our influence in our woods and like having our mash bill, everything that creates our flavor profile. And I've said it over and over again, but like this is the explanation of what I've been saying the whole time. It's that climate that makes a massive difference in Orkney. So we might say, somebody was asking like, is the 10 year old or entry level, do we go younger? We can go younger, but you know one of the things that we actually don't do is we don't go younger because it's actually quite difficult because of our climate. So when you look at aging, and we'll take Ireland as the benchmark, just because, you know, we're just savage. <laughs> but we take Ireland as the benchmark in what we do. If you take a look at uh, a lot of rum production and we take a look at Caribbean rum, uh, they have like, what's called a tropical aging process. And a tropical aging process is three times faster than we age. So if I was to put something in a barrel here for nine years, it'd be the equivalent of putting something in a barrel in Jamaica for three years. In Orkney, we have almost the opposite effect because that climate is so much colder. So I'm sure everybody here knows like what aging does, but to give, to give the explanation of it, wood expands and contracts. So wood soaks in the liquid and pushes out the liquid. When it's... Um, when it's colder, it pushes out the liquid. When it's warmer, it expands and it soaks in the liquid. It almost works like a sponge kind of effect. So you have to think that it's a colder climate here in Speyside. So we have to, like you can see their Orkney averages are between 4 and 12 degrees. Like, and that's the majority of their all year round. They, their highest is up to about 27, but it's very, very rare that happens. And they get battered by winds and they get battered by gales. Somebody made a really good kind of comment there to say salt. Like, when you think of how wood 
just because it reacts on the inside doesn't mean it doesn't react like that on the outside. So when you've got sea winds bashing against these barrels, they do take in a little bit of salt and salt does come through in the liquid. But this creates our flavor. But when we have this liquid that a lot of the year isn't soaked up by the barrels because of the cl colder to climate, it's actually sitting in the barrel. We does take us longer to create that aging process. So that, but it's a slower process and it makes everything very, very different in what we do. And when we get this aged liquid, when we get to there, the final thing that we look about in our production is cask harmonization. Now, the next whiskey we're gonna go on to is something I haven't tried and it's something I'm really excited to try. Um, so what I'll do is we'll actually jump on to the next whiskey and then I'll discuss cask harmonization afterwards. So I, I jumped up that slide. I'm not even gonna put that slide up just yet. So we're gonna move on to the twisted tattoo. And I'm not going to say anything about it. Michael, I don't know how you do feel about this. I didn't describe, explain, talk, about you, talk to you about this before. There's something quite original about the barrel policy in this whiskey. Michael, if anybody can actually guess what the barrels are, do you think we might give a prize for it? 100%. So we'll give 100 mil of our single cask. So we'll give you a nice one then. Just let us know. Can you tell us, without going on to Google, uh, <laughs> what, what is the maturation of uh, this, what, what's the, the, the extra maturation in this cask? Something that's not normal in pretty much the Scotch industry, but 100% not normal in, in Highland Park. So if you can put up the name of the cask barrel on the chat, uh, and the first one to get it right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a little, a little prize. Um, and it's, Alan, we're right. it's, it's, it's not a finish, it's, it is a finish, isn't it? It's a, it, it is a finish. Now, the aging process in this is very, very different to start with. There's two types of barrels that actually come through this. Um, Don't mention one of them. <laughs> I'm not going to mention it, but we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Um, but it's so different in this. And Mike Michael says, it's really something that's not done in Scotch whiskey. I was quite lucky while I was in Scotland um, when I was staying in Scotland, uh, I got to try a lot of the releases by the Scotch Whiskey Society. And when I got to try these releases by the Scotch Whiskey Society, this type of barrel was very rarely used, but it had a massive impact. And I love this finish. And I can tell you, we have had the right answer so far. Yeah, the right answer has popped up. Um, so, some people got it kind of right, but we'll move on and we'll show you. Alan, I think you said it, Rioja cask. So it's something quite different in what we have. And also in our flavor notes. So it's a first filled bourbon cask. So we moved away from our sherry cask, we moved into bourbon. But that Rioja cask really creates flavor, really creates body. And there's something that I was amazed when I had the red wine cask whiskeys in Scotland. I said it's not something that's done so often, but this is a fantastic bottling. The Twisted Tattoo, it's a 16 year old, 67, 46.7%. It was created looking at the tattoo heritage within the Viking um, uh, uh, higher, within the Viking heresy. And it was a Danish tattoo artist, Colin Dale, that actually created the label for this. And there's a whole story behind this about the Norse legend of the Midgar serpent, which grew so large that it twisted around the earth and it was able to grasp its own tail in its mouth and encompass the earth. But this is 46.7%. First filled bourbon, so we're getting our sweetness, we're getting our vanillas, we're getting those flavors out of it. But that red wine Rioja cask is adding so much. And even as I'm talking right now, I'm telling to myself, shut up and just drink this. It's amazing, isn't it? It's something completely different as well. And I love that. And someone alluded to that, that, that Tipperary distillery does this as well. And you know, we've had a Tipperary taste and we had some great whiskeys and Rioja casks there as well. Um, Alan, Alan Kazali, uh, you've won a wee prize there. Um, I can't remember your name from all the auras we had in. So if you can just send me a private message on the chat with your order number, and uh, then I can send. I'll have all your details and I can send out then. Um, or you can send. You can send your order number on the chat. Nobody's going to know who you are anyway. Once we've got the number, that's fine. But it is. It's, this is like. Um, it is stunner. It is a bit of a stunner, isn't it? You know, it's. Absolutely. It's not been in, in, in a Rioja cast for all its life, you know. Um, and people are talking about the Tipperary one, you know, which is yeah, which is fantastic whiskey as well. And it had a, lots of colour in there and lots of, because it's, it's been there for a long time. 
This is not really near as, as long as the Tipper really is done as a different way. Uh, and it's it's very unusual for Scotland to do Spanish Rioja cas because in Scotland just they just think what well, we've got to go down to Jerez and get some sherry sherry cast mum you know forget the rest of the country in Spain we're just going down there and it's only really there's only a, really a few sort of distilleries in Scotland that are using wine casks from different regions around Europe um, like Bruclari would be quite famous for using lots of French wine casks and doing different things there because they had the contacts to do that and it's sort of a it's sort of a thing that in Scotland it's like well we don't really do that but shall we try it and 90% of them go no we won't we'll stick to what we're doing and the second part went, yeah let's do this you know so it's, it's quite groundbreaking you know in Ireland at the moment we're so innovative it's unbelievable yeah. so this is like in Scotland this is like really this is innovation like 110, 20 percent. You know, this is off the charts in Scotland. Whereas in Ireland, you're like, oh yeah, we've done that. And oh yeah, he's done that. And he's done that. You know. Whereas in Ireland, in in, in Scotland, this is just a little bit like coming at the comfort zone a little bit. You know, you you've been making whiskey for 200 years. Why would you do that? So that's that's the difference here. And that's like I love I love that that opportunity. They've taken this opportunity. Let's do something different. Uh, Alan, you've got on your tasting notes there, peaches, and that was the first thing that just popped out to me. I have, I have it on uh, my tasting notes here that you can see they're very intricate, you know. A lovely A4 sheet of paper with not much written on it. That, that's what, Michael, that's where mine started. I just make them look fancy, putting them on a PowerPoint. <laughs> I get that like stone through that peachiness, that apricotiness, you know, really isn't there. Uh, and it, it reminds me, like you know, if you were picking peaches in Spain or something, and you know that you know, that peach juice you can buy in like Italy and Spain, and having a sip of it, it's like that viscous viscousness of it. It's not like a normal fruit juice, you know. It's like thick and gooey, you know. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So people ask it. It's a twelve-year bourbon with a four-year uh, we all have finished, um, but it's it's such a difference kind of maker, and it's it's really an interesting as a finish to see in Scotch whiskey. As Michael is kind of allowed to alluded to, and that answers the other question. It's bourbon, and then Rioja. Um, it's not married. It's moved from bourbon to Rioja. But to give you one, so we've got two more whiskies left to taste, and the two whiskies we're going to taste are really all about the whiskies. But to finish off the journey of Highland Park and to finish off how we, we've talked about our distilling, we've talked about our, uh, our barley, how we malt some of our barley, how we take some of our barley, how important our ageing is to us, how important our hobbister more peat is to us, how important our climate is to us. Cask harmonisation is a word that we use and it's a descriptive word to how we finish and how we actually finish off our whiskey. And to give you an idea of this, cast, people think cast harmonization is balancing and everything, but it's, it's how we bring our whiskies down. And the story is behind it. It was a professor called John Piggott who realized that what are the three things that we have in a whiskey bar? We have alcohol, we have flavor, and we have water. Alcohol coming from fermentation, which is coming from a natural process, and flavor, which is something that's naturally grown within our wood, are both almost kind of natural compounds. Water is unnatural. So if we look at them from a base level, alcohol and flavor stick together. Water just surrounds them. And as we add more water, it tries to separate them, tries to move them apart. Our cask harmonization is about trying to limit the amount of filtration we have to do. So we try not, we, 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 when I say we try not to, we don't chill filter our whiskey. What we actually do is, when we take our whiskey from barrel, so as I said earlier, we age it at 69.8% ABV. Also, when we look at our climate, we age it at a higher ABV than a lot of other, than some other people do, because we have to count for that in our climate as well to actually let our whiskey up, uh, hold itself together and hold, uh, hold itself up against that rough climate. But we actually then dilute it down to about, 50% ABV. We don't go all the way down to 40 or 46 or a bottle and strengths. We dilute it down slowly to 50% ABV. And then we leave it sitting for a few months again. Because what we're trying to do is if you take a bottle of whiskey that's been aged in barrel at our cast strength and you just dump the water in to bring it to 40%, you get that haze and you get that cloudy reaction. Because that's literally the water trying to separate the flavor and the alcohol. 
And that's why people have to filter because they have to remove that haze. We bring it down slowly and we leave it to settle again. And now, from an accountant's perspective, they absolutely hate it because effectively, we're paying to store water. But what this does is it stops us from creating that hazy effect. And that hazy effect, so then when we add in our next drop of water to bring it back down to our bottling strength, whatever bottling strength is going to be, it means we don't have to filter our, like, our whiskey. To, so, and when filtering, although filtering can, is a necessary process for a lot, and there, I'm not going to lie, there is a level of filtering, but it's nowhere near the level that a lot of other distilleries do. We're not stripping away some flavor compounds either. So you get more of that natural distillation. You get more of that natural barrel notes within the whiskey coming from the fact that, from our cask harmonization policy. Then we'll get mouth, mouth, the mouthfeel is a lot different in Highland Park to other whiskeys. The, the MABV, as we know, when we look at that, because I, I, I've always said the mouthfeel of Highland Park is moreish, it's bigger, it's fuller. It's in your mouth, it runs around and it's, it coats your tongue, it coats the sides, it coats your upper palate. It's really, really good. And that, Alan, you've explained that to me there and that, that, that's why. You know, it's a, it's a more viscous spirit. It's a more viscous whiskey because it's not being stripped apart, you know. It's not being made to look good on a supermarket shelf on a cold day, you know. 100%. And it does. You, you, it keeps that oiliness. And that oiliness really is what actually creates that mouthfeel, creates that coat your mouth, really sticks with you, really goes there. That's a, That was a stunner. For me, that's like a... Uh, fantastic. I, I love red wine. I, I was actually trying to hold back from tasting this. Uh, like, I've been <laughs> bottling... I bottled like 120 of them samples every like, in the last couple of weeks. I was like, want to try this, want to try this, want to try this. I didn't. And then I broke when uh, at seven o'clock tonight when you came on the call says, ah, shit, I'm going to try it anyway before the tasting. <laughs> well, and so before everybody was admitted to the room, I was actually pouring this and drinking this and like, I had to try it. It was just, I was so excited by it, you know, because I hadn't had it. It was only released last year. And I was like, and I really enjoyed it. And like, mm, I want more. And I want more. Uh, and it's really good. It's, it's something, you know, it's, Alan, I hope, I'm hoping that you, you guys are going to get an allocation of this into Ireland because, well, I'll try and sell it for you, but if I don't sell it for you, I'll definitely Make drink it. it all. <laughs> it's a win-win for you, you know? Oh, and, it's, and you know what, Michael, like people have mentioned Tipperary and you've mentioned we've been doing this in Ireland. Personally, I, I adore red wine cask finished whiskeys. Yeah. Just adore them. Like I think they're some of the most amazing things I've tried. So, and it, the really interesting thing in Scotland is you don't get distilleries doing it, but when you do get that Scotch Whiskey Society, the guys in 1661 have some of them. And yeah. uh, like some of them are just amazing because they're so innovative and they just play around with things that like the, the cask finishes that the Scotch Whiskey Society do are spectacular. It's funny enough you mentioned the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, like Alan. This morning, I had to go up very early and sit online because uh, they had their first, uh, their, their October outturn. It's the release of all the new whiskies. And yesterday, I missed out on the Highland Park official bottle of the cash rent. Now, I know I'm going to get it as, uh, when it comes available again in the next few days. But uh, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society had a 15-year-old cash rent Highland Park up for sale this morning. And you had to be on that button at 9 o'clock to get it. So I was in there getting logged in and got all logged in. And after four minutes, it was sold out. Wow. And uh, it's the only way to me. I, I had to buy a value pack, as it's called. It was six bottles. Of, so I had to buy five other bottles of whiskey and this whiskey. It cost me 400 euro just to get this 15-year-old cast friend Highland Park, you know. It sold out in four, four minutes this, uh, as a single bottle on its own. It's Highland Park. And, and that was one of my questions that I would have asked Martin. Um, tonight was why isn't Highland Park releasing cash rent whiskey? So I was thinking that question on Monday, the, the press release and all that came out on Tuesday, Wednesday, I went, bugger, you beat me to it, you know, you're, you're bringing it out. They, they have released it, they have released a, a, an official bottling of the cash rent, which is excellent, you know, there's no age statement on it, but I guarantee that's going to be a whopper of a whiskey and I can't wait to get my hands on it. For the moment, I have to wait and I have to enjoy the, the, the Scotch malt whiskey one that's coming next week. Right. Um, on whiskey. I, I do know from speaking to the guys in Highland Park that one of the things about cast strength is that they do age at a higher ABV than a lot of others would so to do a cast strength at 69.8% is quite strong as well so I think they try to avoid it a little bit 
I'm sure they they like to do something. They do bring it down a bit for other bottlings. I think but it was, it was what, when we brought out the, the you know the the El Mulligan single cast from Highland Park in July. There, the yeah. one thing was like for me it was like it's six to three and a half percent. They're like Jesus Christ, <laughs> how is that going to go down with people? It's twelve years old. That, but they do they fill their casks at like sixty nine and a half percent. Where a lot of the stories fill at sixty three percent. So. So they still have the natural, you know, evaporation. It comes down, yes. and maturation is going on there. It's just they have a different operation to other distilleries, and it works for them. Yeah. And it really works because that single cask that we have is, yeah, it's I'm obviously going to be biased. It's got my name on the bottle, but it's one of the most phenomenal Highland Parks I've ever tried. And um, the reason I've got no, I've got every other single bottle of Highland Park in front of me tonight except that one, because that one's in the bottle bin. Because I keep drinking it and it's empty. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, excellent. So, we're going to move on to our our, our next one, uh, Alan. I think yeah. it's, it's another new release, quite so quite brand new, well. new, brand brand new, and a really kind of innovative kind of style for Highlands. And like Michael was saying, they're one of the distilleries that are really trying to actually be innovative. They got a gold medal in the Spirits Business Scotch Whiskey Awards for 2020, and it was three Highland Park legend whiskey makers, John Motion. Gordon Motion, which is just, just the name in itself, Gordon Motion, Max McFarlane and John Ramsey, they hand-selected and combined three principal cast types uh, for the influence of the wood and the casks, the seasoning and the flavour. So what we have is first filled seasoned Spanish oak butts, first filled sherry seasoned American oak casks, and first filled bourbon casks and hogsheads all combined and in a small number of refill casks. So what we're going to get is... From our sherry seasoned American oak casks, we're going to get that again. We're, and from our sherry seasoned Spanish oak casks, or Spanish oak butts, we're getting that, um, that, that, sorry, the dried fruits, those sultanas, those raisins. Uh, from the American, we're getting that, we're getting a bit of a lighter kind of style coming through into it. From the Spanish oak butts, we're getting more of that kind of deep kind of liquid through. Uh, that deeper kind of flavor within the sherry and our first little bourbon is going to bring that sweetness. It's going to bring those sugars. It's going to bring all that. Yeah, people are right there. Um, that's not supposed to be and. <laughs> another, another mistake, as I said, it. it's bourbon barrel, uh, hogshead bourbon barrels. I thought they would add too much whiskey at this stage to care about what the tasting notes were. <laughs> yeah. um, Really oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quite good question there. Um, uh, Jerry Dunn said, he says, excuse my ignorance. Jerry, don't, there's no ignorance here. It's, you're, you're learning all the time. doesn't matter what level you are at whiskey. But Jerry wants to know what's, what is a, a, is a hogshead? A hogshead is, it's, it's, a style of, it's a style of cask. It's a size of cask. Um, it's generally what the Americans use as a kind of descriptor. I'm literally in my own head now. I'm trying to remember the exact literage of it. Um, is it 200 or 220? I, I, I can never get it right. Uh, if anybody does know. Um, <laughs> See, we don't even mind, know, Jerry, so there you go. <laughs> my mind has literally gone blank for exactly what the volume of a hogshead is. Is there, is there a prize for that one too, guys? Is there? 250. 250, there we go. <laughs> That's you and Patterson down in Clonakilty there. He's not getting a prize. He's got enough whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. So what we're going to get from this is we're getting those notes through, but it's also 45.1 uh, ABV. So we're a bit stronger on the ABV again, but it really just comes across so kind of differently again. For me, it's... The sweetness from the bourbon, um, for me, it's the smoky coming through, uh, and but it's the sweetness as well coming from the sherry. So you almost have that kind of sugar sweetness, but that kind of fruity sweetness as well. Alan, I've got a, a nice little video of this because this is actually quite yeah. a special whiskey because it was, um, it was, um, it was, um, you know, the, there was three mis whiskey makers went into this. So it's quite a, a special thing. Um, it just wasn't like, yeah, I will do this. There's over 100 years experience gone into this. So uh, give me a second. I, I, I think it's, this will be a really nice video. Uh, I just have to share the screen. Um, 
Uh, there was a question there on the Triskillian. It's it's a Celtic kind of design. It's a Celtic spiral design. Is so it's the, it, but it's a tree headed one. So the idea with the Triskillian is the tree master and the whiskey makers coming together to make this one whiskey. And I, I'm hoping to God I haven't jumped ahead of it there. <laughs> I, I just go to this, this is the, the best video I've uh, I've actually seen from Highland Park because normally at uh, Martin we do a lot of the videos and Martin's uh, from da Denmark. And he has a very good English uh, accent. He speaks the Scottish accent, in fairness. And um, we've got Gordon Motion. Uh, he was the, the master whiskey maker for Highland Park. And it's unbelievable. They put subtitles on for him. And he's a, he's a Scotsman. So we've got a Scotsman who's got subtitles. The last time I remember that was like watching a Rab C. Nesbitt movie in, in somewhere in, in, the, in the world. But I'm going to put this, just play this whisk, uh, the video for you. It's, it's really nice. Master whiskey maker for Highland Park. I'm going to talk today about Triskelion. Triskelion comes from the Old Norse for wisdom and inspiration, and I worked with two of the previous master whiskey makers for Highland Park, John Ramsey and Max McFarlane, and between us we have over a hundred years of experience. And together we created this special edition whiskey, Triskelion. Bottled at 45.1%, Triskelion uses three different types of first fill cask. First fill Spanish oak sherry casks, first fill American oak sherry casks, and first fill bourbon casks. Each of those chosen by one of us is a characteristic they like about the whiskey. The bourbon casks give a lovely creme brulee note to it and a, a cloudy honey character. The Spanish oak sherry casks tend to give a more spicy character and they also contribute to the, the deep russet colour of it. And the American oak sherry casks, again, give a vanilla and sweet, almost floral character. A hint of rose in there. It's naturally colour-driven, deep russet. Special edition Triskelion. Skull. Well, there was a, I love the fact that you know a Scotsman has to get subtitles, you know, a Danishman who speaks English doesn't. <laughs> Michael, I said this once or twice, you might need them yourself. <laughs> uh, probably this stage, you might have to, we're on uh, whiskey number seven, so probably, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a cracking drama, it's a new release, it's something I haven't tried, and I'm, I was delighted to have it. And, um, put it in the, into the into the tasting tonight. Just as something completely different, you know. And, and this would be one of the newest releases from Highland Park as well. So we are trying where, where kind of where they're going and what they're doing as well, which is always great to do. More it's Christmas lovely, whiskey. Arthur, I think you just like your whiskey at Christmas especially, do you? <laughs> um, I like it all year round, you know. <laughs> A lot of Christmas whiskey going on there, Arthur. <laughs> the same time, you must be easy to you must be easy to get a present for at least. Well, my brother's also in here, so I'm kind of leaving hints at this point. <laughs> it's a lovely whiskey. This will set you back at probably just shy of two hundred euro a bottle. So, a really a nice tram to have tonight. Yeah, no, Michael. Thank you very much for putting special like this on. It is amazing. I think the Highland Park tasting is probably the only whiskey tasting I've probably lost money on. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've either drank it all or I'm just like, ah, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, you know. This, this could have been a 12, 12 whiskeys in a tasting because I was like, I was sitting there, like, what do I cut out? We've got to cut this, you can't have them all, you know. Um, so we, we narrowed it down to eight, which is actually the largest tasting we've ever done. Um, but I'm hoping everyone is enjoying it. And we've got one more whiskey to go, which is like probably for me, it's, it's, it's my special go to whiskey that I would drink on not Christmas Day, but Stephen's Day. The day after when you've got rid of the family and they're all gone and they, they stopped annoying you. And you sit back and you're on your own, you're in your nice little comfy chair, and you just want to drink something that nobody else is going to wreck your head about. And it's Highland Park 18, you know, it's a phenomenal dram. Um, this is the, the 2018 batch, 
Uh, there has been a 2019 batch. I don't think there's a 2020 batch out at the moment. It's a phenomenal whiskey. Right. If you look at that bottle, it's actually more fuller than, say, any other bottles we've had in the tasting tonight. And that's not because I've, uh, I've been drinking all the rest of them. It's probably because I've had to go into the fifth bottle for this one, doing all the bottle and all the samples. Because when I was bottling all the samples, it was like, oh, I might just have a wee dram. So I had... So I went through more bottles of this than I did anything else. So um, if any of you got your tasting packs uh, late, that's, you can blame it on this. Don't blame it on me. Blame it on this whiskey. Uh, because when you've got, this is a, this is a treat for me. It's just something that, like I said, I would treat myself at Christmas time for this. So when you've got half a dozen bottles of them in your house and you're working from home and you're bottling these whiskeys, you, naturally you're going to have a wee go at it, aren't you? You know, you're going to, i go on then. Just a wee one, you know. So um, nine o'clock in the morning when you're starting on the bottle and run, you go, I'll hold off till 10 o'clock before I have one, you know. Oh, I've, I've had some fun in my gap in the last two weeks bottling these. <laughs> I have that one for you. I have that one for you, one for me kind of image coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we talked earlier and we talked about how the 12 year old is the definition of the distillery and the definition of Highland Park does, for me, the 18 year old is the definition of Orkney. It really, it, it embodies and encompasses everything about Orkney and its islands. Like this is, it, it's, I would describe it in, a, in a many ways, a dream dram. Um, it is just fantastic. It's 18 years in that climate we spoke about. You're looking at 45% first fill uh, sherry oak. It's 100% it's European sherry oak. So 45% first fill, 55% refill. 42% ABV, dark, heavy, not heavy, bold notes, cherries, dark chocolate, toffees, marzipans, heather, everything just pops in this whiskey. This to me is like one of my favorite, favorite whiskeys in the world. It's just, uh, there's not as much I can say. It's just fantastic. It's a stunner. It's an absolute stunner. You know, I'd actually love to drink this every other day, but I don't. I can say I, I drink it at Christmas time and I drink it on special occasions, my birthday, things like that. And, you know, because it's something to look forward to. And it's one of these whiskies that I look forward to drinking over the year. You know, I can have a bottle of that sitting in my press for the, for the rest of the year. And, and, and in fact, that probably will. I won't, go, I won't go and sit down and mill this tonight. I just won't because it, it deserves more respect than that, you know. It deserves respect. It deserves to be brought out for a special occasion. So maybe when we get rid of COVID, I'll be milling it then and then, you know, but it's brought up for a special occasion at certain times, birthdays, anniversaries, you know, things that you enjoy in your life and you want to re remember that moment in life. And that's what Highland Park 18 is for me, you know. It's a great whiskey. And then I'm going to pick up a book here, Alan. This is a book that goes back to, I think, Jesus, probably the early 2000s, a guy called Paul Piccolot, who was a, a, a famous uh, sort of whiskey writer in, in New York, he put this by sort of book together of all these different tasting notes and basically says, you know, it's like the world's greatest distilled spirit at present time. Buy whatever you can find. Now that's gone back 20 years ago. Uh, and then I look at his, his I looked at his, high, his tasting note for Island Park, 12 year old, it says, if the miraculous Highland Park 18-year-old wasn't already my favourite distilled spirit of all time, this classic might well be. And, you know, this is one of the most renowned journalists and spirit journalists in the world who basically says, the 18-year-old is amazing. If the 18-year-old wasn't there, 12-year-old is amazing. And, you know, it's, our, it's my two, two go-to whiskies in different occasions, you know. And um, it's phenomenal, you know. Every whiskey, see, every whiskey journalist loves the stuff. You, yeah, because you can see there, even in the notes, two-time winner of the Spirits Journal, best spirit in the world. So think of everything literally in the world. It is literally the best. It's been awarded the best spirit in the world. I think this year it came about fifth on the list as well. And there were some amazing products ahead of it. Uh, don't ask me what they were, I can't tell you. I know there was a Appleton 20-year-old in it, but like literally just absolute fun. Fantastic. And Ian just had a really good point there. What's the difference between the standard Viking Pride, Highland Park 18, and the Travel Excellence? Uh, 
To add to it, Jean, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I don't know. We don't, I don't generally deal in the travel and retail side, so I couldn't tell you. I can gladly find out and we can pass the answer back through the mails and my, uh, with Michael. I can find out, but I don't 100% know. But as we've talked about our whiskey, we went from our Viking scares looking at our heritage. We went from our honour. This is our Viking pride. And this is something really to have pride in and to show that pride towards the Viking culture that really is embodied in Orkney. And that's when I talked about it being the, the embodiment of Orkney itself. It's a, it's a stunning dram, isn't it? It's like sit back, enjoy and love it. I love it, you know. I say that bottle's going in the press. I probably have one more out it tonight, you know. Just <laughs> one more. And then I put it away, you know. Because I, I, you know, I still got a little bit of twelve-year-old in here. I can, if I want some more whiskey, I can have that. Um, gonna I'm, not, ask, I'm, I'm not far behind you, Michael. Either. <laughs> can I have that. I, I want that ball. You got more than your ball. <laughs> <laughs> the full one is a ten. Still fantastic, but like, and the things that we started on the ten, and this was kind of the evolution that I wanted to bring you on to show you. And like the 18 was always going to be the one to finish on. It was always going to be the one I really loved. But like the 10 year old to share, show you the evolution is fantastic. But like, and no offense to the 10 year old in any way to go from the 18 oh. to the 10, it's just counterproductive in itself. So I want to give away a, a, another prize. So I'm going to ask a wee bit of a curveball question here. Uh, the founder of uh, the Highland Park Distillery, uh, Magnus. But I want to know, this is a wee bit, like I say, a curveball. If you know anything about Scottish names and, or Viking names, who was, Ma who was Magnus the son of? And it's in his name. You've got to spell it correctly as well. Jesus, they're on the ball. They're all, they're all typing away here. Who's got it right here? Uh, I think it's uh, Lucas Carr. It's right. You and son. Magnus, you and son. So we didn't know about the history of names. I was always taught in, in Scotland that if you, know, if, if you were called Robert's son, you were the son of Robert. And it, it comes from Viking heritage. So you and son. Uh, so Magnus was the son of you and, you know. And that's how your son names go. Um, whether my, my, my history is correct or not, I don't care. And if you can call me out on it. I don't care, but Lucas, um, can you just send me a private message in the chat with your order number that you ordered this tasting set for this tonight? So I've got your details and I can send you out 100 mil of our uh, lovely uh, single cast. Well done, Lucas. Well done, Lucas. Um, guys, that, you know, uh, Michael, you would have been bang on there like uh, on that as well. Like even in Ireland, we obviously have this, the, the sons in Scotland and the Max as well. So mm. Mac always came from son of, so... Uh, and any name that's Maka means Mach, as in son. So you're 100% bang on there. And there's one for everybody in the audience. Sorry, Brendan, we don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the toy show. <laughs> so, Alan, I'd just like to say thank you very much for tonight. Um, okay, thank you. Um, bit of an epic taste. And eight whiskies, you know, some something else. But every one of them absolutely stunning in their own way, completely different. Uh, I love that twisted tattoo. That was something else. Oh, fantastic. And I love the Triskelion and, and, you know, obviously I love 18, I love 12. What am I saying? I'm saying I love them all. You know, I might just cut to the chase and say I love them all. They're all great. And um, I hope everybody else enjoyed it as well. Uh, it's a phenomenal night. So, Alan, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for having us. From ourselves, um, Michael said we are CC uh, H, CC Hellenic. Uh, we are the distributors for Highland Park in Ireland. It's, it's, we're only delighted to help you out here to bring you the single cask, which I'd, it, I'd, I'd say to anybody, definitely take a look at that. It is, if you were part of the Still Fest, you would have tried it. It's amazing. Uh, you is sticking it up there, good man, you. Um, but thank you very much to Michael and to the, the team in Mulligans for allowing us to do this, to talk to you tonight, to have this moment, to have a few whiskeys. And fairness to Michael, like putting on a, a top kind of list of tastings, eight whiskeys, all fantastic in their own ways. And from the Twisted Tattoo to the 18 to the 10 year old, Michael, thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Alan. And good night, everybody. Um, just before we finish up, I'll just let you know, um, we have no tasting on the 16th of October because... Um, 
the company they were working with wanted to do something completely off the wall, and um, that didn't happen. So on the 23rd of October, we are welcoming them uh, Gelston's Whiskey uh, back to uh, our tastings events. We had them back in the shop in February, long before all this um, COVID thing started. But they're coming in, and um, they'll be retasting their 26-year-old um, a 26-year-old whiskey from a, a distillery from the north coast of Ireland um, that other people sell for seven grand a bottle. They sell for 350 euros a bottle. Uh, so we're tasting that. It's phenomenal. But we'll also be tasting something absolutely amazing from them. It's, it was just bottled today. And it's a, a single pot still finished in a Pinot Noir cask. So we've got the wine casting going on again. And this will be the first event that we, uh, we tasted that. So that's on the 23rd of October. It'll be going on sale on Monday this week. Well, what's this? So Monday the 5th of October at 7 o'clock. We do expect a bit of demand on the tasting, but hopefully lots of tickets available, uh, loads of bottles. Uh, and we'll, be, we'll be trying a load of whiskey from the range. Uh, three new whiskeys that it haven't been released yet. So that's coming up on Mon on. The 20, ooh, I've lost all my dates now, don't you? Uh, 23rd of October, but it's on sale on Monday at 7 o'clock. Um, so you'll get the email the, on Monday afternoon at some stage. But thanks very much, everybody. It's been great to see you all, and uh, I really hope you enjoy tonight. And sláinte, and we'll see you in the, the next few tastings. Thank for you. Anybody that, anybody thanks, that has man, a drop great left, job. For anybody that has a drop left for our Viking Heritage in Highland Park, we won't even say Slanta, we'll say Skull. Enjoy us. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. Yep. Cheers.